Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for coming out and being part of Research Day, and thanks for allowing me to talk. So I'm going to give, uh, I'm a fourth year biostatistics PhD student, and I am going to talk about some work I've been doing with my advisor, Dr. Mark Piekis, on capturing multi-subject brain activity. So recently, in the neuroimaging world, there's been uh, a large set of many times publicly available data sets. So that are looking at specific diseases that we understand have some sort of neurological component, but we are trying to better understand what's going on inside the brain, both structurally and functionally. So for an example, we have the ADNI, which is looking at Alzheimer's disease. There's a large database looking at Parkinson's disease, and then also looking at conditions such as autism, but also just trying to understand what does normal cognitive development look like when you're looking at the structure and the activity of the brain. So each of these is collecting many different types of neuroimaging. There's all sorts of acronyms, fMRI, MRI, DTI, EEG. These are all sort of technologies that are looking at what does the structure of the brain look like as people progress through a disease or through a health state or as people are just naturally um, going through adolescence or aging. And um, so each of these data sets has a specific question, and we want to better understand the underlying processes of these data sets to help better understand the disease, to help us improve treatment and diagnosis of each of these conditions. And to take full advantage of these data sets, which have potentially hundreds or thousands of subjects, we need better statistical methodologies to sort of harness the full power of the data. So specifically, my work my most recent work has been on electroencephalography, or EEG data. And many of you have probably seen a picture of somebody getting an EEG. You put on the skull cap, and there's electrodes placed all over their head. And at each electrode, what it's doing is it's measuring the electrical activity at that location on the skull to try to get at the activity of the brain at that location. So we have this, this EEG data recorded. And what we're doing is we're estimating what's known as the power spectrum. So the technical definition is here. It's a smooth curve that shows a proportion of the total variance of a time series, or EEG recording, that can be explained by waveforms at each frequency. So what the heck does that mean? I have two examples of what you might get out of an EEG recording here, and then there are the power spectra from those recordings. So the top one you can see is sort of a slower moving wave. It has this sort of slow up and down movement that's dominated by it's called low frequency. So you see the, the peak in that spectral density on the right is sort of off in the left low frequency area. Likewise, the, uh, the bottom EEG recording has lots of rapid back and forth movement. That's called high frequency signal. And its associated power spectra has this peak up on the far right side. So these power spectra are telling us something about the underlying EEG recordings, the, the brain activity that's going on in each subject. So this is sort of our goal metric to analyze from each of these subjects. And the data that we're working on is a large twin study that's um, been collected here at Minnesota. So what's really nice about the Minnesota twin family study and twin studies in general is that you know uh, monozygotic or identical twins share 100% of their genetic material, and dizygotic or fraternal twins share 50% of the genetic material on average. So you can look at the difference there and to help you better understand how much of the differences between people or the variation in a trait can be explained by their genetic material. And that's what's known as heritability. So we are looking here as a first step in this analysis of these. So there's about 1,100 twins in this study, and we want to understand of these power spectra curves, sort of how much of the differences between subjects can be explained by their genetic material. And we've run this analysis, and it turns out that 65% of the differences between subjects is uh, can be explained by genetics. So it's clear that the, the brain signals the collect, as collected by the EEG machine, there is some sort of genetic component to the activity of the brain. So this has been sort of the first step in this analysis. But as I referenced earlier, there's a lot of uh, sort of, this is an adolescent cohort, so we'd like to understand things like what is, sort of how does this change across time, cognitive development, and many of these, there's also behavioral and psychological data collected on this. So we'd like to understand how both the genetic component and uh, sort of the, the neuroimaging or neurological component are interacting with conditions such as substance abuse or depression or any other uh, mental health condition that 
has been collected in this data set. Thank you all.